and you sit down and the people open up that word and it's right what you need right when you need it and it's like God is talking to you and you crying up in here and they thinking you crying because you hurt but you crying because you done been helped you crying because you done got what you needed from God to walk another day to live a little bit longer to press a little bit further Let's look at verse 18. First lady, anything else? We good to go? All right. And so the Bible tells us here, amen, and therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore. But thine eyes shall see thy teachers, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it. When you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. Most high, we thank you for your precious word. Your word that's more valuable to us than silver or gold, than rubies or emeralds. Your word that's sweeter than honey on the honeycomb, God. And we just love your word, God, and we thank you for it. Where will we be without your word, God? What will we be doing with, if we didn't have your word, God? We'd still be stuck in the world if we didn't have your word, God. But your word, you sent it to heal us, to save us, to bless us, to clean us up. And we will never take your word for granted, Father God. We thank you for it. And we pray that you would anoint your word tonight, that you would come on in like a mighty rushing wind and set your people's heart on fire, God. We pray in the name of Yahshua HaMashiach, if there's anybody watching or in here that's not saved, that you would save them with a mighty, irrevocable calling, God, and set them on fire for your glory. We pray, King, that the saints will be edified, encouraged, and built up, Father God, that the gates of hell will not prevail against your church as you said it, Father God, and that you'd be lifted high. And the Bible says if you be lifted up, that you would draw all men unto yourself, God. And so we pray that Lord you be lifted up and you fulfill your promise fulfill your word that you would draw your people from the north the south the east and from the west God revive the Hebrews God hallelujah fight against those that fight against us God and prepare a table before us in the presence of all of our and your enemies and we just thank you for it God bind the enemy out and loose your anointing in in Yahshua Jesus name we pray Amen, amen, amen. Come on, give y'all some praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, saints of God, if you remember, we've been talking about Isaiah 30. Brothers, thank y'all so much. Appreciate y'all. Awesome job once again. Hallelujah. We've been talking about Isaiah 30, and, and the whole uh, message was a rebellious people. Say that with me, a rebellious people. And so we went into... Hallelujah, uh, the beginning of chapter 30, where God was actually telling us uh, how we rebelled as a people against him. Amen. And for the most part, it was all about our alliances with the world, uh, specifically that the Hebrews were looking to Egypt for help instead of the most high. Um, secondarily, hallelujah, we rebelled and, and uh, the situation, not only of looking to Egypt for help, but we rejected the word of God. Amen. And that's what many of the Hebrews do. And so God said, you're a rebellious people. Um, because of that, retribution occurred. And so we looked at rebellious, then we talked about retribution. It's all, all retribution is is when, hallelujah, uh, you commit sinful or criminal activity and God brings judgment upon you. And so we rebelled and God judged us, huh? And so we looked at that sudden ruin, total ruin, financial ruin, and he gave us the gospel and that he said, in returning and rest shall you be saved, in quietness and confidence shall your strength be. 
And then we looked at our last point, which we are on right now. For after rebellious, after the retribution, comes the reconciliation. Somebody say reconciliation. reconciliation. That's right. That's right. Because God is not angry with us always. All right. And that's a blessing of a thing. He's slow to anger. But when he gets angry, he doesn't stay angry with us. He is an awesome God. In fact, our God teaches us, amen, that he would rather show mercy than judgment, that he delights in the prosperity of his servants. He showed us in his word that he tells the wicked, he questions the wicked, why die? Why be wicked? Why do the wrong thing? God never takes pleasure, the Bible says, in the death of the wicked. And so God has a heart of reconciliation. Even when we're doing wrong, he's thinking about how he could recover us. And it's on us why we not recovered. It's never on God. God is always right where we left him. Anybody hear me up in here? Amen. He's right where we left him. Hallelujah. But it's, it's, the onus is on us to return back to God. All right. He always has a heart of reconciliation. Isn't that a great thing about our God, y'all? Hallelujah. And so we talked about that, that reconciliation with our God. And so when we looked at it in, in relation to us as a nation and our rebellion, God was teaching us that when he begins to reconcile us, some things are going to begin to happen for us. Uh, we covered one of them, I don't know, it wasn't last week, wasn't the week before, the last time I was teaching in this text, amen, because we did a whole Esther series and Esther play. But we talked about the people shall dwell in Zion. And we said that the first thing that God is going to do when he reconciles us huh, is to bring us back home. Amen. All right. And we talked about home. You hear me, Malvo? We talked about home. And the Hebrews don't know what home is. You know, we ain't never had a home, our own nation, our own government. We gave you the correlation of having a black city or a black school or a black university. And that's all cool. And we feel good about that. But we never had what? A home. And so we talked about having our own home and going home. The people shall dwell in Zion. And so tonight... We're going to continue talking about that reconciliation, and we're going to talk about the next thing that God says, and it's coming out of, hallelujah, verse 18, all right? We're going to talk about answered prayer, answered prayer, because not only God is going to reconcile us, make up with us, and begin to bring us home, huh? he's also going to answer our prayers. Anybody think that that's an awesome thing that God would answer our prayers? All right. And so we get that. We get that in verse 18. The Bible reads, and therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. And therefore, uh, or rather not, not 18, not 18. Hallelujah. Come on. Let's go back. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Hallelujah. I must have liked that so much. Okay. 19. All right. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. All right? Okay. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will what? Answer thee. All right? All right? So another response to us coming back to God is answered prayer. He will be very gracious unto thee. And at thy voice of thy cry, he will answer thee. All right. This is when you need God. You know, we just sung about I need you. Huh? And all of us, whether in our national uh, uh, representation or our individual lives, we all need something from God. All right. I talk about this all the time with my kids or, or with people all around. You know, there's nobody in the world that don't need anything from God. All right. No matter where you are on the scale of life, you could be a billionaire. But it's something, some things that you can only get from God. And so I find myself, no matter where God take me, no matter how much he bless me, no matter how much whatever, I always have prayer requests, Deacon Heaven. Something that I don't have, something that I need. All right? How many people need something from God tonight? All right? And that's all of us. And so God is saying a part of him redeeming us as a people and bringing us back in unison with him 
as the Hebrews, huh? Is that he's going to hear the voice of our cry and he's going to answer us. Our prayer is just not going to go up, Brother Carl, but he's going to answer us speedily, huh? It's a part of being in relationship. Answered prayer. Answered prayer is a blessing, saints. Ian Bounds, who's the prayer apostle, and when we founded this church, amen, hallelujah, we gave books out to our leaders in the very beginning. And some of the books we gave to our ministers and our deacons at that time, amen, one of them was Ian Bounds' prayer, because that's what this church is founded upon. Another one was Charles Spurgeon, the soul winner, because we would always, since the beginning, and even until now, always been about the souls of men. Anybody hear me up in here? All about the souls of men and all about prayer, all right? So Ian Bounds, he says this. He says, answered prayers brings praying out of the realm of fantasy, and it brings it into reality. When God answers your prayer, it brings it out of fantasy into reality. It lets you know that there's actually somebody on the other line that's listening. Unbelievers watch us pray and they think that we're doing it like the false religions, meditating, saying some useless repetitions. But when a believer pray, we're not going through a mental or emotional exercise. We are actually talking to our maker, our creator, our provider, our redeemer. And when we talk to him and we see the, the, the request that he, we ask for, when we see it come through, when we see the house come through, the car come through, the healing come through, when we see the, the barren wound, have children, anybody hear me up in here? We know that it's not a fantasy thing that we're doing, but we brought fantasy, we brought, we brought prayer from fantasy to reality. That's the power of answered prayer. We not only bring praying from fantasy to reality, Brother Jacob, we bring God from fantasy to reality. You see, they praying to many gods out there. They talking to all kind of people out there, all kind of spirits, all kind of personages. They have many large, small L out there, but there is only one God. Anybody hear me up in here? And Yahweh is his name. When people watch us pray and they see our God answer us and they see him come through, it brings God out of the fantasy into the reality. When we out here praying at 201 Pine Street for a building, huh? A building that's too much to pay for, a building that we could never afford or never get into. When we walk around that building seven times for those that was with us, when, hallelujah, when the people had already told us no, they wasn't going to give it. That prayer brought God out the fantasy into the reality because ain't nobody can move some things but our God. Anybody hear me up in here? You see what I'm saying? Answered prayer not only takes prayer from fantasy, it takes God out of fantasy and brings him in reality. We know that somebody's listening up there. We know that somebody cares up there. We know that somebody exists up there. And we know that Yahweh is his name. Come on, give y'all some praise up in here. We talking about answered prayer. Amen. And so when we pray as Hebrews, in this last dispensation, God is going to take our prayer up a notch. If you think that he's been answering you so far, you ain't seen nothing yet. Anybody hear me up in here? I'm talking about a prayer that, as the Bible say, while they still speak it, God come through for you. You ain't even finished your prayer. You say, God, I need a move, and it already done move. Started move when you say the N-word. God, I need a move, and it start moving. That's the kind of answered prayer that God's going to be operating in in this new dispensation. And he's starting already. He's starting already. He's starting already. He's starting already. He's doing things that we never hoped, asked, or even dreamed of. He's going above your hopes and dreams. All you have to do is stay plugged in. All you got to do is stay in position. All you got to do is stay in the right place. And God is going to move like he's never moved before. 
all right? I'm describing to you a new dispensation that's here already. It's coming to your life real soon, all right? Like they say, coming to theater soon. Huh? Coming to your home soon, another level of answered prayer. And as believers, as people watch us, huh? Ian Bounds in his book, he says this, answered prayer proves that God lives, that there is a God. Huh? And your unbelieving family and friends, one thing that they could never argue about is your answered prayer. They can't argue about that. They might talk about the church you go to. They might talk about how you read your Bible too much. They might talk about how you dress too much. They might even talk about how you give too much. But one thing they could never argue with is when you prayed for that house, you got a house and they didn't get a house. When you wanted a car, they, you got a car and they didn't get no car. And when you prayed for a husband, hey God, they might even look better than you. You got a husband and they didn't get no husband. Anybody hear me up in here? All right, we talking about answered prayer. Ain't nothing proves to a lost man that God is, is when they see the hand of God move for his children. All right, it proves that God is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Not only does it prove his existence to our unbelieving family, but it proves his interest, hallelujah, in his people and in his creation. Answered prayer shows that he exists, but also that he loves us. Because we pray and we ask him for what we need. And let me tell you, God don't need to give us anything, y'all. He's already given us enough at the cross. He don't owe us nothing, y'all. But he gives us. Imagine your prayer request, huh? Everything like, God, I'm not feeling good today. God, my feet hurt, my knees hurt. God, if you can help me in this relationship, you know, listen, ultimately, none of those things help God out. None of those things changes God. God could just mind his business and not help any of us, and it wouldn't change who he is. But the reason why he invades our space, invades our lives, is because he loves us. Anybody hear me up in here? The Bible says, cast your cares upon God because he cared for you. It's a heart of love that makes him answer us. Pray, answer prayer proves his existence, and it also proves his love and his interest for his creation. Answered prayer proves when we're in right relationship with God. All right? Now watch this. It proves we are in right relationship with God. You see? The Bible says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask what you will and it shall be given. You see, some of us who are elders in the church can tell when you living for God and all you are when you're playing with God. And we can tell, amen, by answered prayer. You see, the elders can tell. You see. A lot of people are, hallelujah, impressed by how people pray. They're impressed by the words. And so people get up in prayer and they're using all kind of big words. God, the eschatology. God, the soteriology. God, they make it up word, the supercalifragilistic, expialidocious anointing that you have. You know what I'm saying? And that's all good and that sounds good, but it don't prove our relationship with God. It proves that we can talk. It proves that we have proper enunciation and elocution. Huh? But I would rather you not be able to pronounce words. I would rather you not be able to use big words. But what I would rather is, is that when you pray that God hear you on the other line, I don't care if you don't have the correct, hallelujah, grandma or whatever it is. You see what I'm saying? That's what we should be aiming for. Huh? Huh? When you're in right relationship with God, when you're abiding with God, you are going to see God answer your prayers. Fakers don't see prayer requests answered. People who are disconnected don't see prayer requests answered. This is a discernment tip for you. Huh? Sometimes we get confused who with God and who not with God. 
Sometimes we get confused with Jesus and Barabbas. Sometimes we get confused, huh, with who's Deborah or who's Jezebel. And sometimes we looking around in the church and we say, Lord, we don't know who for you or against you. Let me give you a little hint of discernment right here. The best way to tell, hallelujah, who's abiding with God, who's connected with God, is to follow the scriptures. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be given. The ones that's abiding are given what they request. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me up in here. Y'all ain't hearing me up in here. Are you confused about who with God and who not? Check out the prayer request. Check out their prayer life. Check out who, who God moving for. Huh? And when in your prayer life he not moving for you, check your relationship. Check your relationship. You've been sitting there asking for something, pleading for something. Go through, do an inventory of your life. Ask God, God, please show me where I failed you. Have I been looking at things I shouldn't be looking at? Have I been listening to things I shouldn't be listening to? Have I been doing things I shouldn't be doing? Why is my prayer life clogged up? And God going to tell you you're not abiding in me. And my words are not abiding in you. Therefore, you can't ask me for what you want. It shall not be given. Not that you're not saved, but just that you're not abiding. Not that you're not saved, just that you're not connected. Not that you're not saved, just that you're not a part of the true vine like you need to. I can't get the sap out, the anointing out, the blessing out, because you're not connected like you need to be. So it's important when you're looking at others to see who connected or not, but it's important that when you look at yourself, am I connected? All right? And it's also important for this. When you go around messing with people, huh? let me give you a little word of advice. Check their prayer life. Don't mess with nobody that God hears. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me. <laughs> y'all ain't. Don't mess with nobody that God hears. If you look at their life and everything they done planned, prepared, had said, and it's coming to pass, don't mess with that. Amen. Get your hands off of that. Get your mouth off of that. Let me tell you something, y'all. I done met some prayer warriors. I done met some prayer apostles. I done met some men and some women of God that when they put it down on their prayer panel, all you got to do is wait for it and it's coming to pass. It's coming to pass. The camels are coming. The camels are coming. The camels are coming. The camels are coming. And you know what, Lynn? I done seen some Judases that sound good, but ain't nothing coming when they pray. Ain't nothing coming when they pray. Couldn't heal a dog. Couldn't lay hands and, and, and oh God, heal a 99 degree fever. No abiding. No answered prayer. Are you hearing me tonight? Answered prayer is proof positive of right relationship all right I want you to think about your church for a second has there been any, anything we prayed for yet that we didn't get that or better oh y'all ain't hearing y'all don't want to talk to me tonight y'all don't want to talk to me tonight y'all don't want to admit that because if y'all don't want to admit it I will you see that little boy sitting over there Y'all remember when we prayed for that little boy in heaven, we said, Lord, we need a boy. And y'all stood in agreement with y'all pastor. You see that little boy, that little bad one over there? <laughs> Blessed but bad? Huh? No, he not bad. He, he, he anointed. Amen. <laughs> he called. He spoken for. He beloved. He saved and sanctified on fire for Jesus, huh? We speak it on. He gonna carry his daddy's anointing. Hey, anybody hear me up in here? All right, all right. Listen, listen. When we pray, brother Carl, when we pray, huh? Did he not answer us? You see, answered prayer is proof positive that God exists. 
but it's also proof positive when you're in a right relationship. We are a little small church. We began to pray, Lord, let them know us in the nation. Jesus. <laughs> we up in there praying, Brother Carl. We holding hand up in there. Lord, let them know us in the nation. You know, sometimes your prayer be bigger than what you really know you're praying. You don't even know, Lynn. We don't even be knowing. And we grab hands and we pray, let them know us in the nation. We want to be a national church. We want to have more than one church. Anybody remember us praying that? Huh? Lord, a factory of churches. Huh? You know what he did, y'all? He told, he, he told us, I heard you. Amen. And I'm giving you a request because you're in right relationship with me. Oh, man, my God. My God, my God, my God. We talking about answered prayer, y'all. It's proof that God lives, proof that he cares about us, proof that we right, in a right relationship with him. Huh? Answered prayer proves that we really praying. Huh? It proves that we really praying because sometimes you could say your prayers without praying. But it proves that you're really praying when you get the request that you prayed for answered. Hmm. Huh? It proves that we asking in the right name when we pray. Anybody hear me? And a lot of people, they be, you know, okay, y'all believe y'all Hebrews, but why y'all why y'all still say Jesus? Why we still say Jesus? Because there's power in the name of Jesus. We pray for this building in the name of Jesus. We heal cancer in the name of Jesus. We, we laid hands and healed heart conditions in the name of Jesus. We prayed for barren wounds and they got delivered in the name of Jesus. We, we prayed for people who was locked up and the bars opened wide in the name of Jesus. People got saved in here in the name of Jesus. So why in the world would I stop using the name of Jesus? He hears the name of Jesus. And no matter what you praying in this church, Yahshua or Jesus, nobody going to ever judge you on that. Because we know right now that he hears the name of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I done laid hands on people that's been, hallelujah, afflicted by the enemy. And then spoke the name of Jesus over them. They coughing, they throwing up, and whatever they had before was gone after we spoke the name. After we spoke the name, after we spoke the name, you see, and I don't know, maybe they changed the name and they had wicked purposes. But what sometimes what the devil meant for bad, God turn it around and work it for good and say, I'm going to still honor that name, Jesus. You see what I'm saying? How many people he saved with that name? Anybody hear me up in here? How many people got answered prayer in that name? So why would you be condemned on using that name? Oh, you, it's, it's nothing. If you say my name Amr in Arabic, or you say my name Omar in English, it is the same name, but just a different language. But it's still my name. And since God understands every language, whether you say Jesus, 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 Yahshua, he says, huh, what, what do you need to them all? Anybody hear me up in here? The limited, the limit, the limited minds of men think God speak only one language. And of all the languages, he going to speak English in 2012? That's the only language that God going to speak? Revelation say that when he come back, he going to have a name that nobody knows. Nobody going to know his new name. And we tripping about which name. Man, go ahead on, man. I say I got names y'all don't even know about yet. But answered prayer teaches us the existence of God, the love of God, proof of our relationship with God. Proves, amen, when we really praying. Proves when we praying in the right name. And it also proves when we praying the will of God. 
When you pray the will of God, your prayers get answered. Because sometimes, y'all, we could pray amiss. We praying for things that God know we shouldn't have or things that's only going to harm us or hurt us. And so when you learn how to get the will of God on the inside of you, it's going to increase your prayer life. That's why reading our Bible is so important. That word teaches us what God wants for us. And when we pray, we pray his word. We pray his will. Huh? Hallelujah. We, we, we ask him to, to renew our minds and to, and to create in us a clean heart so we could think his thoughts, pray his prayers. And on first when we get saved, y'all, we praying stuff, hallelujah, that's no good for us. And you got to stay in that word. You got to stay in church. And you got to stay, hallelujah, getting filled up. And when that happens, when you find yourself conforming more and more to the image of God, you're going to have prayer answered more and more. Because you're going to be asking not only for what you want for yourself, but you're going to be asking for what God wants for you. Anybody hear me up in here? Yeah, yeah, some things God don't want for you. Yeah, yeah, it's only going to hurt you. All right? But I praise God that he's so sovereign and omniscient that he takes our prayers with a grain of salt. If it's good for us, he's going to give it to us. If it's not, he's going to give us something better than we ask for. That's why prayer is always awesome. That's why it's always awesome. And so answered prayer, hallelujah, I don't have my phone. Hallelujah, glory to God. Answered prayer teaches us Hallelujah. Glory to God. Awesome. Oh, we got time, baby. Lord, <laughs> Hallelujah. So answered prayer is going to be a result of, a, of an awakening. And it's going to be on our people like never before. And I'm ready for it. How many people are ready for it? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But before I leave this point, be watching in your life all my prayers answered. All right. Be watching in the lives of people around you. Do God respect their prayers? And you're going to be able to tell who he with and who he not with. For he that have ears to hear, let him hear what the spirit is saying to the church. Let's look at the second thing we're going to talk about tonight in this new dispensation. He's going to bring us home. He's going to begin to answer our prayers like never before. Thirdly, he's going to send us our teachers back. Send us our teachers back. Pastor, what you mean by that? It's coming out of Isaiah huh? Uh, 30 and 20. And the Bible says, And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers. Now let's break that down for a second. First thing we need to realize is this. Even though the Lord reconciles us and we at peace with him, it don't mean we won't have trouble in our life. Anybody hear me up in here? You know when he gave us the parable about the man building the house, one building on the rock and one building upon the sand, uh, two things that was common in that particular scenario is that in both of the instances, the one who was built upon Christ and the one who wasn't, storms came in both lives. And that's the way it is for the believer. Yes, you're a believer. Yes, God loves you. But in this world, we will have trouble. Anybody hear me up in here? All right. We will have trouble. Trials will come. All right. And you can't run from that. Hallelujah. You can't hide from it. Huh? The good thing is that when we get in trouble, we know who to call on. Anybody hear me up in here? And that's the difference. That's the difference. And so God, right here in this text in verse 20, says that we're going to have adversity and affliction. But look at verse 20 closely. And the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. Where does adversity and affliction come from sometimes? The Lord. The Lord. And most churches won't admit that. Most denominations won't admit that. They'll say, God only gives us good things. He only blesses us. 
They treat God like Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, and the mixture of the fairy godmother. They treat him like all of the, the legends and the fairy tales of old. No, 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 no. God sends trouble. He does. He does. He does. And that's what Job said. Job said, I'm not just going to accept the good from the hand of the Lord. I'm going to accept the good and the bad from the hand of the Lord. In fact, in the book of Job, whose idea it was for Satan to tempt Job in the first place? It was the Lord's idea. God said, have you tried my servant Job? Listen to me. If you've been in a false church with false doctrine, you won't be able to handle adversity because you think that everything that's bad in your life come from the devil. And you'll think that it's just the devil just beating you up. And somehow you're going to give up. Make the devil too big and God too small. Or it's just trouble. The devil just got me. And the devil, the devil, give him all kind of glory. Sometimes problems come from the hand of the Lord. Yeah. It'll come from the hand of the Lord. Who do you think sent Joseph into Egypt? When he was betrayed by his brothers sold into slavery, uh, put into the prison. Joseph caught the revelation, y'all did it for bad, but God did it for good. Anybody hear me up in here? He did it. So sometimes in life, we sit in there blaming the devil. We sit in there thinking that it was our mistake, but a lot of the times God sends adversity and affliction into our lives. And that word in verse 20 and though the Lord, we know who gives it now, sometimes it's the Lord, and sometimes it's based upon our decision, but know that God gives that version of affliction. Then the Lord, watch this, watch this, it says the Lord give. That's the Hebrew word Nathan. And it means to permit. That sometimes, hallelujah, adversity come in our life, and it comes across God's desk. And God say, all right, they can handle it. Because remember, he never going to give us more than we can bear. Anybody hear me up in here? So every kind of trouble that comes into our life, God has permitted it. He either permitted it or it was his idea. All right? No matter if it's his idea or he permitted, the Bible tells us huh, that he will never tempt us. No temptation that is uncommon to man has been on the earth before. And he's never going to give us more than we can bear. And I know sometimes we go through, we say we can't take it no more. But God is saying, you don't know what you could take, and I know that you could take it because you was built for this. Anybody hear me up here? You was built for this. You can take it because you wouldn't be going through it if you couldn't take it. He would have never permitted it if you couldn't take it. All right? It wasn't meant to break you. It was meant to make you. Anybody hear me up in here? And you're going to get caught up in the, in, the, in the weakness of this age because this age is soft. Yes. This age is soft. Yes. The people of this age are soft. Yes. They don't understand, hallelujah, the biblical toughness that we have to have in this world. All right? The church is soft. Anybody hear me up in here? All right? We don't understand adversity. We don't understand affliction. We don't understand conflict. Let me tell you, the church is soft. But when God allows adversity and affliction to come our way, like a father, he does it checking to see, okay, are you strong enough? He's checking our muscles. We strong enough? Well, go right ahead. The first meaning of Nathan is to permit. The second meaning of Nathan, Nathan is to employ. Oh, God. So God permits adversity and affliction, but he also employs adversity and affliction. Yes. Pastor, what do you mean by employ? When we employ somebody, we hire them to get a job done. Adversity and affliction has been employed by God in your life. God hired trouble to produce something in you that a lack of trouble would never be able to produce. Hallelujah. He'll never get what he want from you no any other kind of way. And there's some things that God want out of us that he will not get until he put us through the furnace of affliction. There's some things that done happened in my life that done made me cry. That done made me hurt. But when I go through with the grace of God, 
I might go in broken, but I'll come out whole. Anybody hear me up in here? And when I come out, I'm stronger than I was when I went in. When I come out, I'm wiser than I was when I went in. When I come out, I know more than I knew when I went in. Hallelujah. And there's no way for God to get that in me but me to go through the fire of affliction. And so God employs affliction sometime in your life. He hires it. He says, I got a job to do. I need something out of Omar. I need something out of Misha. I need something out of James, out of Carl, out of Iola. I need something out of Shalanda, something out of John. And I just can't seem to get it with goodness and mercy and blessing. I need to employ something else to get this thing that I want out of them. Woo! My God. My God. My God. And sometimes that's just what God's going to do. Any good worker, you look through your toolbox to, to, to find the tool you need to fix the job. And sometimes you could look in there and you, you look in the good toolbox with the shiny tools, the tools that don't take too much strength and won't hurt something. But hallelujah, sometimes the, the shiny tools won't do it. Sometimes the grease ain't going to do it. Sometimes you need to pull out the hammer. And sometimes a small hammer not going to work. Other times you need to pull out the sledgehammer. Other times you got to pull out the jackhammer. Anybody hear me up in here? Because every job requires a different tool. You see? You see? Yeah. Sometimes our God gives adversity and affliction. He permits it. He employs it. And then the next meaning of Nathan means to be entrusted with it. He entrusts us with it. See, when you entrust something with, with somebody, you give them something valuable. And you trust them not to misuse it, to misunderstand it, to not get what they need out of it. God not only permits adversity in our life, employs it, but he entrusts us with that adversity. Huh? He's trusting that we don't take it the wrong way. The same way as adversity, we go through financial problems.
pressure. Yeah. We go through relationship pressure. Yeah. It's pressure on jobs. Huh? And though we don't like it sometimes, guess what? It's pressure at church. Yeah. Huh? But the Lord gives us both the tight places and the pressure. Huh? Yeah. And you see, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, oh, God. Mm. You know what makes a diamond? Yep. <laughs> Pressure. Yep. We all like a diamond. Yes. We all want a diamond. Yeah. We don't even call it diamonds no more. We call it what? Bling. bling. We, oh, yeah, I want the bling. Yeah. But we don't know what goes into making the bling. Oh. We all want to be like the big names. We all want to have this and have that. We all want the fame, the fortune, the glory. We all want to be like this person, that person. But, so we all want the diamond. I want to be like the diamond. But none of us want the pressure that makes the diamond. My God. Yes, it's only pressure that makes diamonds. We all want to be Joseph, but we don't want the pressure of slavery. My God. We all want to be David, but we don't want the pressure and the tight place of running from Saul. We all want to be Jesus, but we don't want the crown of thorns and we sure don't want no cross. And I got a word for you. There's no, cro there's no crowns without the crosses. Anybody hear me up in here? There's no diamonds without pressure. So when you look at your life and the pressure that you have and the things you're going through, you got to change your perspective. You got to understand that God is trying to make you through this. It, what, no matter what it is, if it's sickness, if, if, it, if it's problems with marriage, if it's problems with the children, you got to look up and say, all right, God, what you want out of me? What are you doing, God? What are you beautifying on me? What are you making? Or what part of me are you making a diamond? You understand what I'm saying? Look at your neighbor and say, my God, my God. is making diamonds in my life. Come on, give him some praise up in here. Woo. That's why you're never going to see your pastor hung down. You ain't going to see him, hallelujah, giving up. All right? Because I know he's making diamonds, y'all. I know he making diamonds, y'all. I know he making diamonds. It don't mean that I'm going to like everything that I go through, but I'm going to praise him for everything that I go through. Amen? The good and the bad. The good and the bad. Hallelujah. Okay, come on. Look, 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 look. let's keep going. Hallelujah. I didn't even get to it. Although the Lord, although the Lord, and though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, watch this, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore all right all right somebody say teachers. teachers all right all right god is saying you may still go through hard times and trouble but huh i'm gonna give you teachers and your teacher's not gonna be in a corner anymore wow. pastor what's a teacher the hebrew word for teacher is yara huh? somebody say yara. yara nice name for a little boy yara Come here, Yara. <laughs> it means somebody who points out. Yara, a teacher, to point. Huh? To point out, to aim finger, huh? to instruct, to, to inform, to lay out something plain, to show. God is saying in his new dispensation, we still might have a little trouble, but he's going to send us teachers. Anybody hear me up in there? He's going to send us teachers, people to inform us, instruct us, to point out things that we need to take care of, that we need to see. All right? Now, a teacher is different than a prophet. All right? A prophet, hallelujah, is somebody that hears from God and tells you what was what is and what is to come, all right? That's a prophet. A prophet operates in the rhema, all right? It's a now word. It's what God needs to tell you now. It's what you're going through right now. It's what y'all was talking about at your house before y'all came. It's what y'all was talking about last night. 
is what you're going through right now. That's the prophetic. When you're in the presence of a prophet, you're going to always leave here saying, man, what not we just talking about that? And if you have nobody to say you was talking about it, it was something that was just in your mind. You was just thinking about that. It was questions that you was just pondering, huh? Because the prophet reveals the things that you thinking, that you're going through in secret and reveal it openly. And it's so open that you think other people know your secrets. You sitting up and then, hold on, pastor, hold on. You know, and you thinking that pastor got a camera at your house. You thinking pastor got a listening device in your car. You thinking that somehow pastor hooked up with Verizon, huh? AT&T, they still have singular. You thinking that pastor done hooked up with your mobile provider and know your business. Pastor don't know your business. You see, you see, when you run into Somebody with a prophetic anointing, the secrets of your heart will be made plain. Your concerns, your dreams, your hopes, your questions. And it is the way that God communicates with his people. We communicate by phone. God communicates through the prophetic. Come on, give y'all some glory up in there. Ooh, that's the rhema. That's the prophet. The teacher is a little bit different. The teacher handles not the rhema, but the logos. The logos. Rhema is now a word. Logos is written word. And the teacher will be, hallelujah, skilled in breaking down the written word. You'll get in the presence of a teacher and understand what you have read before and nothing was in that. When you're in the presence of a teacher, you say, man, I done read that seven times and never heard it like that before. All right? That is the teaching anointing. And we have prophets in this room and we have teachers in this room. The teacher will be able to understand things easily. That's what you've been given. You've been given understanding. And it's a gift from God. Not everybody have it. You read it and you get it. Other people read it and they don't. And it's nothing to laugh at them for. Don't get proud. Huh? Because you just woke up that way. And they woke up another way. They, they have another gift, but you have this gift. All right? If you have the gift, your job in the church is to explain to the people of God the scriptures of God. That is why he's gifted you with the understanding. Sometimes we have the understanding, we can teach, but we never teach for God. And that means we sitting on our gifts. We've taken our talent and we've buried it. If you're a person that can open up the word, understand it, it may be indicative that you have a teaching gift and God needs you to teach his people in the church. Come on, give y'all some praise up in here. All right? All right? You'll find that teachers and prophets get along really well. Teachers love prophets and prophets love teachers. Because most of the time a prophet will come and say something and every now and then the people can't really understand the prophet. But the teacher will look and say, aha, I understand what you mean. Everybody else took it the wrong way. Everybody else want to fight you, but I don't want to fight you. Because I hear the voice of God in what you are saying. All right. And the teacher gets up and in a very didactic, understanding way, explains what the prophet been telling people for years. And y'all are sitting here and look at your husband and say, Negro, I've been telling you this forever. Amen. But when Pastor get up here and he start turning to John chapter 3, now you understand. Amen. All right? And there's nothing wrong with your husband most of the time. All right? It's just that, that one anointing, the prophetic, had to be hooked up yeah. with that teaching anointing to bring complete understanding. Anybody hear me up in here? 
All right? Now, every now and then, you got to know that God gives gifts how he will. And in the church, there are times when a prophet will be a teacher and a teacher will be a prophet. They call it the prophet teacher. You see? You see? Now, when we was coming up and we started the Negro Land Tours huh, with Pastor Darby, my dog. Anybody remember Pastor Darby? Huh? All right. Pastor Darby was a pure prophet. I'm talking about, listen to me, man. You be up in that dude present and he going to tell everybody what color socks you got on and everything else. Huh? It's almost like you in the presence of the prophet and he going to say stuff that's secret stuff that's, and boy, listen, you up in there shaking. Oh, God. Pure prophet. All right? Pure prophet. All right? Now, myself, hallelujah, I am a teacher prophet, all right, because I love the word. I love to read it. I love to study it. I'm telling you, I get off on it. I could spend two, three hours at a time, Lynn, just in the word. Spend so much time, sometimes can't get off the chair. I'm like, oh, God. You know what I'm saying? Why? Because it done got good to me. Huh? That got good to me. I'm in the languages. I'm flowing back and forth in the commentaries, huh? But, and so, so my main gift is teacher. But when I get up here, something moves. And another voice comes out. And I'm sticking to my notes, yeah, but I'm giving space for the Holy Ghost. Anybody hear me up in here? And that's some, that means, and that's why sometimes, even though I'm teaching, you hear about your personal issues as well. All right? And some of y'all leave here saying, Pastor picking on me. And I want to tell you, I love you. But I ain't sitting in my notes in my study thinking about you. It's somebody else that's thinking about you. All right? And thinking about your issues and your shortcomings. So by the time I get up here with the logos, he add the rhema. And you leave here and you sit in your car and you say, my God, was that for me? You know? Now the good ones say, I'm taking it and I'm taking it as God and I'm going to change my life. The bad ones wait for me by the door, wait for me by the back door, <laughs> send me a text, want to ask me, Pastor, you was mad at me? Listen, man, I don't, I don't, I don't follow you around. I don't know if you're drinking. I don't know if you're smoking. I don't know if you're selling drugs. It just so happened that when you come to church, that's that, that, that is the main thrust of my message. Get a revelation. God is talking to you. It ain't Pastor Omar. Come on, give y'all some praise up in here. Woo! So, hallelujah. First lady, I got to check with you again. I don't have, you know what? I got to watch on my wrist. Golly. All right, okay, all right, so we good. Okay, help me out now, Misha, don't you let me, don't you just let me, don't let me drown, throw me a preserver now. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. And so he say, he say he gonna send us teachers, so now we know what teachers are. Huh? And Matthew Henry says, he says, when we return to God as the Hebrews, God will make sure that we will have faithful teachers among us. He's going to begin to raise up amongst our people teachers again. People that know the word, understand the word, you know. Out of nowhere, yo. Out of nowhere, yo. You know. I'm talking about ordinary people. I'm talking about people, listen, you don't even have to have no degrees. You don't have to have nothing. He's just going to raise up out of obscurity. Huh? People that probably couldn't understand their math book in, in school. Just open the Bible and be like, thus said the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Talking about systematic theology and everything else. It's going to be a divine thing. He's going to raise up teachers. And prophetically, some of y'all are part of that new generation of teachers that's coming out for the Hebrews in Jesus' mighty name. All right? Teachers that are faithful and who have God's heart to bless us and not to harm us. Not to harm us. Because we done had teachers 
but their heart have not been to bless us. You see? He's going to send us faithful teachers. And you say, Pastor, why does he connect adversity and affliction with teachers? Why? He go into this lit, big, long thing where he says, listen, I'm a, though, though the Lord give you bread of adversity and water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed. And I want to tell you, when you are going through a rough time, there is nothing like the word of God when you're going through adversity and affliction. Anybody hear me up in here? Huh? When you have the word, Huh? And that's what Jesus was saying. I'm going to liken you unto a man huh, who built his house upon the what? The rock. The word keeps you solid when the wind and the waves and the rain beat up against your life. The word is the rock. He said, he said, a man who, who heard my word and did it. Huh? The word is a rock. And so since the word helps us in adversity and affliction, there's nothing like having a teacher from God when you're going through. Huh? When you're going through. When nobody knows when you're going through, but you come down, and it don't have to be me. It could be in Sunday school. It could be in discipleship training. It could be one of the ministers, one of the deacons. But you come here and you sit down and you're going through hell and high water. And you sit down in here and you at almost your end. And you sit down and the people open up that word and it's right what you need, right when you need it. And it's like God is talking to you. And you crying up in here. And they thinking you crying because you hurt, but you crying because you done been helped. You crying because you done got what you needed from God to walk another day, to live a little bit longer, to press a little bit further. Ain't nothing like a teacher from God when we go through adversity and affliction. And I don't know about you, but I feel in this very place that you done been through some tough times. And this place, either through myself or one of the ministers or the deacons or some of the ladies that's been preaching and teaching in the church, you got what you needed when you needed that. Can I get a hallelujah if anybody heard something? You know what I'm saying? Got you through. You leave here, look, look, never would have made it. And that's the, that's the beauty of a word in due season. And so God tells his people when he reconciles us, builds us up, and brings us back to who we are, he going to release into our ranks teachers, great teachers, teachers that hear from him, teachers that preach his word faithfully, teachers that's not about themselves, but all about the people of God, teachers that when you come and sit under, you go and hear from God. In your toughest times, in your toughest times, he going to permit it, he going to employ it, he going to entrust you with it, but he going to talk you through it the whole way. <laughs> Anybody hear me up in here? It's like he put us in the pool, but he on the side. I'm right here by you. Keep swimming. Keep swimming. Keep swimming. He put us in the fire, but he the fourth man walking with us in the fire. Just follow me. This is the way. Come on. This is the way. Huh? That's the type of God that we serve. Somebody give our God some praise up in here. That's the connection with, hallelujah, adversity and affliction. He says, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore. When a nation is under judgment, God removes the teachers. He removes the teachers. Can't nobody understand the word. So can't nobody preach it like it's supposed to be preached. Don't mean that you won't have teachers, but it's just people that's not telling you the heart of God. And when that happens, that means that you're not under the blessings of God, but that you're under the curse of God. And the problem with having bad teachers is this. Understand that the people of God will never go higher than their source. Whoever teaching you, that's where you're going to be at. You can't go above your teacher because they're teaching you. So when you have bad teachers, 
unfaithful teachers, teachers that don't know the word, when you have low teachers, guess what you get? Low churches and low people. All right? So God is saying, I'm going to send you teachers from heaven, from glory. I'm going to send you high teachers. And when I reconcile you and send you high teachers, guess what's going to happen to the people? The people going to go high. The people not going to get high. The people going to go high. There's a difference. Don't get high. Go high. I've been getting high too long. Don't get high. Stop getting high. Go high. Say it with me. Go high. You see? But students never surpass their teachers, especially in the spiritual sense. That's why you got to watch where you are. You got to watch who you make your teacher. You got to watch who you submit to as your pastor. Because you will never rise above your source. Water never rises above its source. You see? It's pouring out. It's always going to rise to right where the source is, but no higher. You see? No higher. We got people letting anybody teach them. What you have to do is look at your teacher life and examine if they worthy to teach you. You understand what I'm saying? Is that not what the Bible say, Deacon Heaven? He said, you shall know them by their fruit. That's the way you tell real teachers and fake teachers, real prophets and false prophets. You look at their life. You look at their fruit. You look at their marriage. You look at their children. You look at everything that they got going on, and you say to yourself, is that a person that I want to teach me? Can I learn something from them? We got people, hallelujah, under low teachers. And surprised when they have low lives. You can never rise above your source. Now listen to me good right here. All right? All right? In spiritual things. You see? Your marriage never going to rise up over the marriage of your teacher. So as you watch their marriage, that's the marriage you're going to have. Whether good or bad. Now you see me and First Lady, how y'all feel about that? Yeah. Baby, I'm in love, baby, I'm in love. Lord. You understand what I, yeah, all right? Oh, thank you, baby! Oh, Lord! Y'all, we gonna dismiss right now, we gonna go ahead. Let me see y'all, may the Lord bless you. I'm just joking, I'm just joking. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay, okay. All right, all right, in your marriage, in your kids, in your kids, all right, in your educational pursuits, you see, in your entrepreneurship, in your blessings, in your health. We should nod in her head, but she's jumping on the inside you. I'm telling y'all, I'm telling y'all, listen to me good. He's going to send us faithful teachers. And you got to watch who you put yourself under. Sometimes you, you're putting yourself under somebody that's actually lower than you. And you're going to watch your life get lowered. <laughs> you're going to watch your health get lowered. Because <laughs> they ain't got a healing anointing over there. They, ain't got, they sick themselves. You're going to watch everything fall apart. You're going to watch the blessings fall apart. And you're going to watch everything fall apart because you're putting yourself under an anointing and a teacher that's not blessed. I always watch who I put myself under. I got to look at their life and look at it and see, Miss Andrews, I got to say, that's some of the things that I want. And if I see some of the things that I want, then baby, that's where I'm going. You see, Brooke, sometimes we look at y'all. Me and First Lady talk about you sometimes. And we talk about how you're about to graduate from college. We talk about how you're right at in PCA. And I hate to point you out, and I'm going to take off my glasses because you're getting uncomfortable. That's my, my discernment saying, hallelujah. But, but what I'm saying is this, you know, oftentimes you're going to see something released in the body. Huh? Huh? And 
And what you're going to see release in the body is what done fell on the head first. You see, the oil runs. The oil runs off the head of Aaron, down his beard, all the way down his chest. And the Bible says to his skirts. Anybody hear me up in here? The oil runs down. It don't run up. The anointing runs down. It don't run up. Huh? So you ask yourself, hell, what anointing I want to raise my kids under? Huh, Miss Michelle? What anointing I want to raise my kids under? What anointing I want to have my marriage under? What anointing I want to open my business under? What anointing I want to put my body and my health under? What anointing is it? Is it an anointing God answered prayer? Is it an anointing that, ooh, my God, I don't know if y'all hearing me up in here. He said you're going to send your teachers in this new dispensation. Faithful teachers that understand the word. Let me tell you something. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something. You're part of a blessed church. <laughs> Misha, Misha, they don't know me. Misha, look, they don't know me. They only know the half of it, Misha. They don't know the whole story. If I tell them the whole story, they're going to think I'm bragging. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. No, no, they're going to say I'm bragging. I'm trying to teach y'all the word. I'm trying to teach y'all the principle. Whether you decide to stay here or not, just don't get under anything that's lower than what you leave. And anybody hear me up in here? Don't get under anything lower than you leave. What you say, Minister Stan? Stop right there. All right, I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to stop right there. He said he's going to send you teachers. Teachers after his own heart. He says, hallelujah, they won't be in a corner no more because when you're in judgment, the teachers would be in caves, they would be in corners. He says, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers, your teachers. You'll see them with your eyes. See the way they live. See their families. See my hand upon them. You see? Can you tell when God's hand is on somebody? Can you see the supernatural? Can you tell when it's, when it's, when it's, when it's something other than themselves? You know? You know, sometimes I, I despise my education sometimes. And I despise the fact that I'm an attorney with a jurist doctrine. I despise that sometimes. Because sometimes people look at my life and they say, but, but he's smart. Wow. Sometimes they look at my life and they say, but, but he's a good communicator. And sometimes they look at my life and they say, but yeah, but he a lawyer. You see? But what they don't understand is that those things can't make happen what happened in my life. You understand what I'm saying? It's God, and you got to give God glory. Don't look at me and say that, that that's because of him. Don't ever do that. Listen, my, oh, God. Y'all don't know where I come from, man. My God. John, you remember them days at Moss, John? <laughs> they don't know where we come from, baby. My God. You know? That's why they say we half hood and holy. We still hood, baby. We still, we still project, John. We still. You know what I'm saying? Was, was Madison a little clothing line? That you? Huh? Yeah, a ghetto. Educated, but still a little ghetto. You know what I'm saying? That's the shirt you got on, pretty? Yeah, you got that on. Thank you, Lord. A ghetto. Big brother, you know the struggle. It's got to be God, tree. It's got to be him. You know? All right, I done shared my heart, Kev. Anything else I need to talk about? Come on, prophet, tell me if something hits your heart. You say what? What do you say? Hallelujah. Listen, we're going to get going then. Let's have a word of prayer. Most high, we thank you for a new dispensation. 
We thank you for answered prayer. And we thank you for sending us teachers. And most high, I pray that as you send us what we need as a people, that we would not get caught up in the persons, but that we would see the hand of him who's sending us the people. <laughs> you are raising up great men and great women in this time. And you are raising them up for such a time as this. We have been so disobedient in times past. Stephen said of us that we always resist the Holy Ghost. He went through Moses and Joshua, Caleb, and, and Joseph, and we always found ourselves on the wrong side of God. My prayer tonight is that you would finally awaken your people. That they would not miss those who you sin. That they would cry no longer for Barabbas instead of Jesus. That they would go not towards the Pharisees instead of Jesus. That they wouldn't side with Judas instead of Yahshua. Give us wisdom as a body. Give us understanding as a body. Give us discernment as a body. Help us to see whose prayer that you're answering, God. Help us to see who, hallelujah, your hand is with. Help us to see the teachers that you have brought up in our midst. Help us to receive the prophets that you are raising up amongst us. Help us not to be the generation who stones the prophets, but at the same time build the prophets' sepulchers, God. We don't want to be hypocrites. We want to finally get it right, God. So give us discernment. Open our eyes and help us see. All we want is to be on your side. All we want is to do what you're doing. So Abba, please, whatever you're doing, don't do it without us, God. In Yahshua, Jesus' name we pray. And the church say, amen, amen, amen. Come on, give y'all some praise in this place. Come on, give him some praise. If you're here tonight, hallelujah, and you're not saved, and you want to be saved, this is easy. All you do is admit that you're a sinner and believe in Yahshua, Jesus Christ, as your Savior. The Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You're one word away from forgiveness. And so we admit, we believe, and then we confess. And so I'm going to pray with you right now. And I want you to focus. It's not the prayer. It's not the words. It's what you mean in your heart. Say with me tonight, say, God, Yahweh, Yahshua, Jesus, Elohim, Adonai, Jireh, Rapha, Sitzkanu, I come to you, most high. King of kings and Lord of lords with your many names you know who I'm talking about I admit I am not perfect but I need you to save me to help me and to bless me 
I believe in you. Your death, your burial, and your resurrection. Save me, Jaira. Save me, Rafa. Save me, Yahweh. Forgive me of my sins. And use me in these last days. Show me my gifts. And stir up my gifts. If it's teaching, then let me teach. If it's preaching, then let me preach. If it's counseling, I want to counsel your people. If it's serving, I want to serve your people. Use me in these last days. Bless me in these last days. And put me in a ministry that you have called, you have chosen. Help me to examine my teachers. Help me to examine myself and bless me in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, give him some praise. Give him some praise. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and bless you with shalom peace. And as you go, notice on our website, we have a place for prayer. Don't you go through life just praying for yourself. Go on the website. Put down the prayer request. You have a mighty church with mighty intercessors that's ready to stand in agreement with you. He hears our prayers from this place. He hears them. And we are ready to pray with you. May he bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. And bless you with shalom. Peace. Shalom Israel. Shalom Israel. Be blessed. And go higher. Don't get higher. But go higher. In Jesus name. Love y'all. Be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You satisfy the longing.